Mason, because as, a, as an extremely senior government official who is uh, beyond busy, he has been so generous with his time. It's rare for a, a government official to undertake so many briefings to the public to keep them on board with what the administration is doing. And while it's rare, it's actually a very good thing. It shows transparency, it shows availability, and it shows integrity. Uh, I should finally say about my friend Jason Greenblatt that not only is he a family man and a man of, 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 of high integrity, I believe he really is a feather in the cap of the President of the United States. Many people speak about a high turnaround in the White House. Jason has not only been in the administration from day one, uh, he has been at the President's side for more than two decades as his uh, attorney at the Trump Organization, and he has the President's ear. And if you get to know Jason as a person, you'll, you'll understand why. Uh, he is a, a very unique and special man, and I thank you for your devoted service to the United States of America, and God bless you. Thank you. Um, more to my left, although that is uh, not a political statement, but one of just geography, is my very dear friend, Brett Stevens. Uh, I could go on about Brett. He's asked me to keep it very short, so I will do so simply by saying, Brett is universally recognized for being one of the finest writers in America today. Um, Israel has few defenders as eloquent in the English language as Brett. That felt like a drum roll. Israel has few defenders who are as eloquent. Um, like Jason, Brett is a family man. He's extremely devoted to his three children. And Jason is devoted to his six, but he cheated, he has, he has triplets, so, you know. Um, two very devoted family men. I can personally attest to what a loyal and amazing friend Brett is, what a man of integrity and righteousness and goodness. He, because uh, he has his critics and I have probably a lot more, I, I find it amazing when people speak about Brett Stevens and his convictions when I know him to be a man of supreme conviction who has always followed his convictions. And his convictions lead him to write the columns that he writes every single week, whether I agree with him fully or if I don't agree with him, Brett. This is a democracy, he has the right to be wrong. But um, I'm always, I, I read Brett religiously, and I'm always amazed at his capacity to articulate thought. His mastery of language is really second to none. As you well know, he's the Pulitzer Prize winning columnist of the New York Times. He is here, as he often is at our organization, almost always, without any kind of compensation whatsoever. He does this as a public service. It's a night away from his family, and it's his sign of friendship to me and to our organization and to the values that we stand for, and we're very honored to have you. And God bless you. Thank you very much, Brett. And with that, we're going to begin. And um, the format tonight is extremely uh, casual. This is, meant, this is meant to be a conversation and a dialogue about events that affect all of our lives, affects all of America. The Middle East has a direct bearing on everywhere, let alone for many people in this room who are very pro-Israel, who are very conscious of Israel's security, and who uh, would like to see uh, the highest Jewish value of all, peace, translated to something actually real in the world's most turbulent region. So with that, I'm going to begin. Okay. So, Jason, you've really been in the news lately. Yesterday, um, you spoke at the Jerusalem Post conference. A, you confirmed what Ambassador David Friedman said, that Israel has a right to retain uh, West Bank settlements, settlements in Judea and Samaria. You reconfirmed that. But that's not a big departure from, the Trump, from even the Obama administration, because even when President Obama gave his famous speech, some would say infamous speech at AIPAC where he spoke about the Green Line, Israel turning to the Green Line. Even then he spoke about land swap. So even he acknowledged that Israel would retain some of the settlements. What's also happened recently is that uh, you've announced this economic conference in Bahrain, which is, I think, next Tuesday? Beginning next Tuesday? Tuesday night, yes. And um, the big news today is that Israel is not invited to that conference. And the reason given, as I understand it from the White House, is because the purpose of the conference is to be apolitical and to focus almost exclusively on economics. But we still have to get to, well, Israel has you know, a, a minister who deals with economics. Why is Israel not going to be there? The Palestinians have already announced they're boycotting the conference. Um, some of the other recent developments are that Israel yesterday uh, announced a new town. It'll eventually be a town called uh, Ramat Trump to thank the president for his recognition of the Golan Heights, et cetera, and tensions with Iran are really escalating. Amidst all of that, 
and the Palestinians' refusal to even attend your conference, you're forging ahead. You have been extremely articulate and powerful and persuasive, especially through your social media feed, about the need for the United States to push for peace. So let me begin by asking you, why an economic summit? Why that first? And how? And what are its prospects for any kind of success if both the Palestinians and the Israelis are not there? You have said many times from even this chair that the one thing this administration would not do was impose a plan upon the respective parties that was not bilateral, that was not from them. But here they're not even going to be there to talk. So I think the last comment is probably where I want to start. You're right. We have always said, I've certainly said, we're not going to impose a plan. No one can impose a plan, by the way, not the United States, not the United Nations, no matter what any country or group of countries think that they can come out with resolutions or statements against one party or the other. Nobody could force a peace plan. The parties have to want it. The parties have to be willing to compromise to achieve one. The reason we're starting with the economics first is twofold. One, this is a very detailed peace vision. Uh, you cannot have a successful peace agreement without a successful economic plan which means uh, we're worried about the day after, the weeks after, the months after, and the years after. We don't want to set up a political plan only to find out that it fails and we would put the region into a worse position than the position that it is in now. Um, we could do it all at once, but if we did it all at once, it would be a great, um, a great deal of information for people to digest, and we felt the best thing to do would start with the economics, let the Palestinians understand, and, and by the way, there's some benefits for Jordan and Egypt as well. Let the region understand the many great things that could happen for the Palestinian people from this economic plan if we also achieve a political plan, uh, a political agreement, if you will. Um, the Palestinian Authority, in particular Saab Arakat, has been out there decrying what we're trying to do. He is telling everybody that we're only trying to create economic peace, that we're trying to buy the Palestinians off. Completely untrue. Every time we speak about it, we explain there are two parts to the plan. Can everyone hear Jason? No. I'll just let you Sorry, sorry. The feedback was... Okay. Is this better? Yeah. The Palestinian leadership is decrying the plan. They're explaining or claiming that we're trying to buy the Palestinians off. Nothing could be further from the truth. But we've split the two pieces apart intentionally. In a perfect world, we would have released the political vision shortly after the economic vision. We had uh, an event in Israel a couple of weeks ago. They were not able to form a government. There's now new elections. And we'll have to make a decision after the Bahrain workshop as to when we will release the plan. If we decide not to release it during the, gov uh, during the election and government coalition uh, formation, we may be kicked all the way to November. November 6th or so is the last day of the new government formation if it takes the entire period of time. Um, that is unfortunate, but as I said yesterday at J-Post, thank God that Israel is a democracy. So I'd rather put up with that inconvenience than, uh, than anything else. Okay, before I follow up on that, Brett, would you mind if I paraphrased an email you sent me today? No. You wouldn't mind? I would mind. Oh, you would mind. So, well, let me ask you, how do you feel about the announcement that uh, neither Israel nor the Palestinians are going to be at this workshop in Bahrain next week? Look, um, the fundamental problem that Israel faces is that you have a Palestinian leadership today that is um, unwilling uh, or unable to come to terms with the idea of peace with its Jewish neighbor in uh, almost any conceivable scenario. So while I think that there's a merit in having a plan that begins with an economic vision and proceeds to a political one, um, the predicate still isn't there, which is that neither on the side of Fatah, much less on the side of Hamas, is there any sort of willingness to, to participate in, in either of it? I mean, look, both aspects, both sides of the Palestinian leadership are participating really almost uh, deliberately in the immiseration and impoverishment of their own people. So you, we're dealing with, you know, you're, you're offering an economic vision to turn these countries into, you know, a Dubai, an Abu Dhabi, whatever it might be, um, 
but their their vision is something completely different. And you saw that plainly with the uprising of Gazans just a few a uh, couple of months ago, rebelling against a Hamas authority that is enriching itself off of their off of the misery of their people. Who are the richest people in the West Bank? I would imagine they're the people who are connected to current centers of, of power within within Fatah. So an economic vision isn't necessarily in their interests either. Look, um, what has to begin before, never mind before a political plan, before an economic plan, is that the administration, and not just the Trump administration, but all Western leaders need to start speaking the truth to the Palestinian people. Number one, you will never destroy Israel, and we will never let you do it. Number two, if you want a state, prove to us that you're worthy of having a state, that a Palestinian state will be an asset in the community of civilized nations and not a liability. Number three, demonstrate in some meaningful way that you're capable of governing yourselves. So far, you're not. And uh, number four, do not have as quasi-legitimate political authorities groups that are sworn to their neighbor's destruction and committed to terrorism as a form of uh, political end-seeking. So all of those sort of uh, come before the question of, you know, what you might offer the Palestinians. If Palestinian, if Palestinian leadership were genuinely interested in economic betterment, they would have gone for it a long time ago. There's a reason they haven't gone for it, because they see their vision of attaining power um, as a combination of the repression of their, of their own people and a kind of glory-seeking in the international arena, which depends on the perception that the Palestinians are the most miserable people on earth. I once spent a few instructive days in the Nile River Delta with an Egyptian friend of mine uh, north of the town of Mansera, basically between Cairo and, uh, and Alexandria. And what was very striking to me was that the poverty that I witnessed in that area of Egypt was far deeper than any of the poverty I witnessed in Gaza on many visits to, to the Strip, uh, never mind Ramallah or, 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 cities, or, or cities there. Um, that, that, that told you something about, you know, what, what the Palestinian situation uh, is. But the, the important point here is I don't think I've ever heard a Western leader simply stand up and say, listen, the Tibetans want a state, the Tamils want a state, the Kurds want a state, the Catalans want a state, the Walloons want a state, the Quebecois want a state, Texans sometimes want a state, California will, will become a state if Trump is reelected. Um, so uh, tell us, Palestinians, what, why we should put you at the top of the list when it comes to a consideration of statehood. What is it that you're prepared to do to demonstrate that we won't just be ushering into existence another South Sudan, another drain on the world's resources, another threat to the region's, uh, to, 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 to the neighborhood. And so far that's not there. So I wish that, I mean, with all respect, I mean, this is where I really think it has to begin, with, with truth-telling by, um, by leading members of the Western community. Okay, let, me, let me jump in here. Well, I, I would say that Jason has told a lot of truth, that you've, uh, you are one of the most active uh, people in the administration on social media, maybe second only to the president himself. And uh, I think the most persuasive things you've been writing, actually, is how humiliating and insulting it is to the Palestinian people who are extremely capable, very well educated, to be continually reliant on international subsidies. And you've been writing about how there has to be greater entrepreneurship, etc. But Brett's response is they've shown little uh, interest in that kind of economic development. And everyone knows Hamas has utterly abused the international aid that they've received, which is per capita is higher than the Marshall Plan. Why, do you, why does the administration believe, Jason, that an economic summit 
is the way to go, that you'll, sub- you'll somehow entice the Palestinians to a peace agreement. And we don't know what that peace agreement is yet. J- uh, Brett is, is alluding to a Palestinian state. We don't know if that is, we don't know what's in the, the peace plan. I don't even know how many people know what's in the peace plan. I'm assuming five or six people on earth know what's in this peace plan. Do you but, know what's in this plan? <laughs> I helped write it, yes. So let's, let's deal with some of what Brett said. Why do you believe that an economic workshop is the way to begin? Yeah, if you don't mind, there's a few things I want to kind of yeah. go in order. So first of all, Brett's obviously not just a great writer, but a, a great speaker. And there's very little that he said that I would disagree with. In fact, I'd agree with just about everything that he said. I do want to point out one thing about the difference between um, Gaza and the West Bank. Very few people understand just how bad Hamas is to its people, to the two million Palestinians there. And when people throw out terms like, this isn't you, but the traditional thinkers, two-state solution, it's so simple. If you just say that, all will be good. They don't realize that two million Palestinians are suffering and subject to the rule of a brutal dictatorship in Hamas. And therefore, it's much more complicated than people think. As far as the... um, the order of things. We could have picked different orders. Uh, we could have released a political plan. We could have tried to get the Palestinian Authority to do all the things you said that are completely legitimate and appropriate. We didn't. Uh, one of my biggest uh, disappointments, and I have many in this job, is that we were not even able to get the Palestinian Authority to stop paying terrorists for killing Israelis. Now, thankfully, Lindsey Graham and others uh, helped fix that problem by passing the Taylor Force Act. But we have been pushing all the things that you're pointing out. We've not succeeded. And what we've decided to do is break apart the audience. We can keep preaching to the Palestinian Authority and go nowhere, or we could speak to the people directly. And what we're saying to the people directly, and the feedback we're getting from ordinary Palestinians has been very positive, is here are the many things that you will be able to um, benefit from if we could reach a peace agreement. It's not take this money and give up your rights or your thoughts or your dreams or your aspirations, however you want to describe them, but it's if your leadership is willing to compromise and create a deal that makes sense for them, that makes sense for Israel, that keeps Israel secure, that um, creates a Palestinian leadership that's responsible in all the ways that you describe it, this is what's waiting for you. But if we can't, then this economic plan will not see the light of day. No one will donate or invest in a Palestinian government or a Palestinian people under the current circumstances. So uh, we chose to do it this way, to reach the people, to make them understand what could be. But I have no uh, problem admitting that it may go nowhere if we get to none of the important things that you're calling out. Well, just just to jump in here. So Jason, this is uh, the first on the record conversation you're having with us here, which I greatly appreciate. And it's a week before everything begins, so it's appropriate. So you're saying the reason why that th- there is an economic summit first is to really circumvent the Palestinian leadership, to try to reach the people, because you believe that while the leadership may be obstinate, while they may be, put, may be putting politics or hatred of Israel or whatever the reason for their obst- obstinacy is, they're putting it before the interests and the needs of the people. You believe that the people really want a better economic life. They want a better education for their children, better schools, better hospitals, better roads. And if you're able to show that, you can circumvent the Palestinian leadership, meaning it's not even that important that the Palestinian leadership are going to be absent from the conference because you think this is going to trickle down to the people. How are they going to make their will known? How are they going to make it known that they want to see this happen? First of all, we, we use the word workshop, not summit, and not uh, conference intentionally. We're going to air ideas, and we're going to want feedback from the audience. It would have been great if the Palestinian leadership showed up to give feedback. Instead, they not only chose to boycott it, they chose to try to undermine it by telling everybody else not to attend or to to lower the level of attendance at the event. How does that help the Palestinian people? That's terrible for the Palestinian people. We're not exactly trying to circumvent it. I would use a different uh, way to describe it. I would say we want the people to understand what awaits them, So we want the message to get out there. We don't have a good media environment there. We can't do the same kind of interviews that we can. We can't do, we don't get uh, the same kind of stories in the Palestinian media that we do elsewhere because the media is a tightly controlled environment. Um, You're right in saying I'm active on social media. One of the pieces that's missing from my social media is a description of the many, many meetings I have with Palestinians all the time who sit in my office or in Jerusalem or anywhere else I meet them where they explain to us that they are thirsting for those things that you describe. 
the infrastructure and everything else, not at the expense of the things they dream about. They do want their state, meaning these Palestinians who sit with me don't uh, say, just give me money and I'll be fine. They want a state, they talk about East Jerusalem, they talk about all the things you would expect them to say, but they are grateful that we are de um, devoting so much time and attention to creating something that if we're successful on the political side, they know they will benefit from tremendously. So circumvent is probably the wrong word, it's more get the word out to the people to see if it's appealing to them in the context of a peace deal. Okay, well, that's a, I mean, that's a tall order to whatever word we use, circumvent, go around, to have this message reach the Palestinian people and uh, without, you know, to the exclusion maybe of their leadership. I mean, how realistic is that, Brett? You were the youngest editor of the Jerusalem Post. You spent a lot of time in the Middle East. You write about the Middle East. You interviewed President Sisi of Egypt. Today, his predecessor, President Morsi, died, had a, a heart attack in a courtroom, died a few hours later. Uh, he served as president for a year. That was kind of, I guess, the will of the Egyptian people when he was elected, but uh, he was part of the Muslim Brotherhood. He was quickly removed. Um, and now we don't really see the will of the people being expressed that much in the Middle East, but it sounds to me, if I'm, I don't want to mischaracterize what Jason's saying, it's for Jason to express himself, but uh, if, it's, if this is to reach the people, where do we see the will of the people in the Middle East expressed in almost any way? Other than Israel. Other than Israel, yes. Actually, the only functioning democracy you have in the Middle East is, is Iraq. Um, something that people rarely point out, but that's, that's also true. Um, we call Iraq a functioning democracy. Well, it is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they have prime minister, they have a parliament, they have institutions of state. So people have stopped noticing because, but that's, this is a whole different uh, discussion. Look, I mean, I, I, I am with, with Jason in uh, believing that there's tremendous amount of um, possibility in the Palestinian people. And uh, I certainly spent a lot of time talking to ordinary Palestinians in my own journalistic life and seeing people who uh, wanted a better future for themselves and their families than the ones that uh, they were likely to have. That's a tragedy for them. It has to be pointed out that the principal reason that they're not achieving that is because they have uh, leadership um, that uh, wants to deny them many of the things they aspire to, peaceful, more peaceful and more prosperous uh, lives, but it's very difficult for the United States or any outside party to dictate the kind of politics that are going to emerge out of um, uh, you know out of their out of their societies. The Bush administration tried that with with the democracy agenda, and unfortunately, one of the patterns that you see emerge in the Middle East is that um, in order to achieve kind of um, social opening, you need autocracy, and when you choose democracy, what you end up with are socially repressive political parties. That is to say, um, since you mentioned Mohamed Morsi, he was the result of a, you know, of a, of a free and f the one free and fair election that Egypt has had in, in, in modern memory, elected a Muslim Brotherhood leader. In Turkey, at least until recently, Erdogan was the popularly elected leader. He's essentially another Muslim, uh, Muslim brother. So you have this, this kind of toxic dynamic in which when you choose a democratic path, you end up with socially repressive parties that are also ultimately autocratic. And if you want to achieve greater social openings, the only people who, are, who have historically been prepared to do that are people like the Shah of Iran or Ataturk or in his own fashion, Mohammed bin Salman, all of whom have used uh, autocratic and often uh, despotic and brutal methods to uh, to achieve those aims. So that's a that's a kind of a dynamic that we've seen in Middle Eastern politics for a long time. I don't know how this or, frankly, any administration uh, breaks away from it, which is why I think it's so important to get away from trying to lay down plans or you know bring parties together or create workshops or whatever you want want to call them, and simply to lay out consistent principles that might lead to the creation of some kind of Palestinian state or, you know, what Benny Gantz calls an independency at some point um, uh, at some point in the future. I really think that that rhetorical footwork is every bit as important, if not more important, 
than sort of the behind the scenes diplomatic work that one administration after another, Democratic and Republican, has tried to undertake almost every single time with frankly dismal results. I hope yours are, are, um, are, are, are more successful. But, but the real problem is that since 1967, Western leaders have not pre been prepared to say the reason we want a Palestinian state if it's, if it's a state that's going to look like Costa Rica. We don't want a Palestinian state if it's going to wind up looking to us like Yemen because we're not going to midwife into existence a new state simply to provide fresh tragedies for the people of the Middle East. Can I respond? Yeah. Yeah. Can I just ask, Ariel, can you, can you or Leo, just can someone bring water, please, for the speakers? And Ariel, you should be up here, please, because we're going to take pictures. Now this is on the record. We're going to put this on Twitter. <laughs> so uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, so I, I think Brad is absolutely correct, and it ties back to an earlier comment you made about speaking the truth. We are about speaking the truth. Palestinian leadership, stop blaming Israel for all of your woes. Palestinian leadership, stop blaming the United States of America for all of your woes. We are ready, and, and we're not interested in just having a summit for the sake of bringing two sides together, and then it goes nowhere. We are releasing a vision, and if the vision makes sense, and it will make sense, it should make sense to both sides, and you're willing to engage, then you'll engage. And if you're not willing to engage, that's fine too. But what we've done, we think, is rip off the Band-Aid of this thing, clean out the wound, try to treat what's inside. Will we be able to stitch it back in a way that the two sides will agree? We know the, you know, the, the tall order there. But we don't think we're going to get anywhere unless we do the things that you're describing, which is both speak the truth, avoid the diplomatic um, uh, big deal of getting people in a room, and lay out ideas that work, that lead to something that makes sense that protects the security of Israel, because I don't think anyone could ever challenge the notion that Israel is not only in a dangerous neighborhood, it faces threats day in and day out, and we have to accept that, and the Palestinians have to accept that, and if they're not willing to accept it, there's not going to be a peace deal. It's very simple. Okay, so... <laughs> Let me just note, and uh, Brett, you'll address this soon, uh, I'm kind of surprised by what you're saying, Brett, because your, your, your book, of course, is famously about criticizing the retreat of the United States from international affairs, especially under President Obama. And you have always written about the importance of the United States taking a leadership role, which would seem to argue that some kind of peace initiative on the part of the United States in the Middle East is essential, as opposed to just simply laying out principles uh, that the United States... What I've been really... Look, do I have my concerns about this peace, uh, this peace deal? Of course I do. Israel has suffered greatly under many of these previous uh, attempts. Having said that, uh, obviously this is an administration that has really proven itself with regards to Israel's security, and I'm not going to go through the whole litany of lists, which we usually do, which is quite incredible, but what President Trump has done in terms of uh, legitimizing Israel at the UN and removing the embassy and removing us from the Iran deal, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, but more importantly, I'm happy that the United States is taking the lead here as opposed to that whole quartet thing and the UN taking the lead. I mean, did we really want someone like Putin being an equal partner? Putin is aiding and abetting uh, a near genocide in Syria. You've been very critical of that. Uh, you've been very courageous on that, Brett. Um, did we really want the EU as, as part of you know, the, this quartet who was leading negotiations as if the EU has shown any kind of uh, uh, fairness? Uh, to Israel. One thing that I really have appreciated, Jason, is in the efforts that you and Jared and David uh, Friedman and Secretary Pompeo have made, is that it's an American-led initiative, which I trust a heck of a lot more than the EU or Putin or who was the other part of the quartet? The UN. The UN, the UN thank you. <laughs> so isn't there something to be said about the United States taking the lead here? Or do you well, think well, it look, really I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm saying anything antithetical to my, my thesis about American retreat from, which was written during the Obama administration. I want, let, let me make a couple of points. You know, I get tagged as a never Trump conservative. I am a sometimes Trump conservative, which is to say when he does things I agree with, I write columns, which never seem to get noticed, uh, praising the president and button. the administration for doing things I think are right. I think moving the embassy was 100% the right thing to do. I supported it publicly. I think getting out of the JCPOA was completely the right thing to do. I supported it publicly. I think recognizing Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights 
was again the right you know the right thing to do. I think these have been bold, courageous, and correct steps by the administration, and I have said so in the pages of the New York Times repeatedly. Okay. Um, and by and the way, what you did in calling out the New York Times for what they admitted was an anti-Semitic cartoon about Netanyahu was extremely courageous <laughs> and very much appreciated. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to call them as uh, uh, I'm trying to call them as I see them, and what I'm simply saying now is. I mean, okay, I'll be a little playful. I think, quite frankly, the efforts, you know, to arrange yet another deal are a little bit too much, are, are not disruptive enough, let me put this that way. And the way well, that Trump is, okay. is, 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 is such a, like him, like him or not, you know, he is, a, he is a disruptor, but the effort for another negotiated settlement sort of falls within the pattern of the broad tradition of American diplomacy going back to the Rogers Plan of 1960s nine or seven or whatever it was um what would be really disruptive is is what i'm is what i'm suggesting which is has the president made a speech and said these are the expectations these are the expectations and these are why we have these the, these expectations i think what really needs to change is an understanding that the issue is not boundaries if it were an issue about boundaries if it were issue an issue about territory we would have settled this a long time ago, sometime during the Nixon administration, even maybe the Johnson administration, okay? Um, the issue was not about economics, because if the Palestinians wanted to live in a much more prosperous way, they would have gone for leaders in the mold of Lee Kuan Yew, not Yasser Arafat, all right? Lee Kuan Yew had his issues, but, you know, he made Singapore a prosperous, uh, uh, a prosperous place. The issue here goes to fundamental choices about what a Palestinian state is supposed to be for. And the answer too many Palestinian leaders have given, current leaders, is really that a Palestinian state is supposed to be for, essentially, the destruction of the Jewish state, right? That, it's, that, that the 1974 so-called plan of stages or phases or whatever it was called never, you know, never really was withdrawn as the fundamental Palestinian ambition, which is why the, the, the so-called, you know, right of, right of return has always been at the center of, a centerpiece of Palestinian politics, why they've consistently elected leaders who don't seem prepared sincerely to make peace with, with not only their Jewish neighbors, but with their Arab neighbors uh, as well. So as a Palestinian state essentially for doing what Hamas is doing now, which is using its territory as a base to wage war against Israel, or as a Palestinian state for the improvement of the lives of the Palestinian people. That's what's, that's what's central, and this is what drives me crazy about some of my progressive critics, and certainly your progressive critics as well, who claim to be pro-Palestinian but are always um, incredibly silent when it comes to the depredations of Hamas, when it comes to the fact that Mahmoud is in the, what, 15th year of his elected four-year term, uh, uh, four term of office, when it comes to a culture, never mind of anti-Semitism and Jew hatred, but also a culture of misogyny and, 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 and uh, domestic repression. They're silent on these points. And we need to start speaking up in a genuine sense for the Palestinian people. And as I, I gather that's what you're kind of talking about when you talk about the e economic improvement of, of the Palestinian people, talking directly to Palestinians themselves and not so-called leaders um, who claim to speak in their name. That's, that's the leadership, um, that's the kind of uh, American, the difference that America could make now. Okay, so, so this is fascinating. I did not expect to hear this tonight. So Brett, you who are, you, you yourself just said, you're, you are often criticized by conservatives for being a never-Trumper. You're actually saying that your issue with the Trump administration's approach to the Middle East is that the president has not been forceful enough in articulating, or condemning, I should say, uh, Palestinian sins, if I may refer to them as that, genocidal ambition, genocidal intent, um, using, uh, uh, using land like Gaza as a springboard for terrorist attacks. You want to hear the president give a forceful declaration, this is what we find utterly unacceptable in Palestinian aspirations, and if it does not change, there will never be peace, and there will be no American support. And you feel the president hasn't done that. Just to add to that for a second, I thought that President Trump did not get enough credit, if I may say so, uh, when he turned down um, Kim Jong-un at the second summit because he could have eased sanctions a little bit 
and gotten a lot of credit for having made progress instead of it being a wasted summit or a failed summit. Instead, he said, without unconditional denuclearization, there will not be any easing of the sanctions. And Kim Jong-un went nuts and maybe even assassinated most of his uh, negotiators two weeks ago. But that was a very strong statement on the part of the president that without full denuclearization, there will not be any easing of sanctions. So you want to see something similar when it comes to the Middle East? Sorry. Oh, hang on a second. Okay. I'm sorry I'm going to say this, Jason. I think the president's policy towards North Korea is a disgrace. I think saying that he accepts Kim Jong-un's word that, he knew, that, that Kim knew nothing about the murder of Otto Warmbier is a disgrace. Otto Warmbier is an American citizen who was murdered by the Kim, Kim regime. I think saying that he exchanges beautiful love letters with Kim Jong-un, who's the most repressive dictator in the world, is a disgrace. I think it was an epic mistake to go and, and dignify someone like Kim with not one but with two summits, I think it is very unfortunate and extremely dangerous that we are downgrading our military relations with our oldest and one of our most reliable democratic allies in the region, South Korea, by way of apparently appeasing the, uh, the Kim regime. And maybe the president is conducting some form of four-dimensional chess. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe he's, he's the Garry Kasparov I've never met. But uh, I think that the North Korea policy is one of the reasons why, sorry, I'm not on the Trump train. I can name, name many other reasons. But since, so we're, here, but since we're here to talk about, okay. since we're here to talk about, the, uh, talk about the Middle East, it used to be the case, it used to be the case that the president, um, presidents would give set piece speeches on separate occasions of matters of great national importance um, on that related to some foreign policy issue or another. President Obama did it on a number of occasions with respect to the Middle East after the, the beginning of the so-called Arab Spring. Uh, that speech doesn't look too good these days. President Bush did it in 2002 when he talked about matching democracy with uh, progress for, for uh, Palestinians 2002 or 2003. I can't, I can't quite remember the date. Other presidents have done it. Trump has been an unusual president in that to the extent that he has acted, it's always been by way of signing an executive order or, or something that, that was not publicly done. It wasn't an act of presidential um, uh, speech making uh, and agenda setting. And that's, that's, I think, a missing dimension of this presidency. It's one of the many ways in which the presidency is, this presidency is just not like a traditional American American presidency. It would be a great thing. And if it's not going to be President Trump, it should be Mike Pompeo or another, you know, senior most member of, 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 of the cabinet delivering these, these points, an American vision for what peace would look like. But by the way, let me say this. At the end of the day, America's agenda, the threats that the United States faces, whether it's from Russia or China or Iran or still potent elements of uh, Sunni jihadist terrorism, all of those rank more highly than whether there's going to be a Palestinian state or not. And it's not the worst thing. And here, by the way, this one area where I'm sort of in sympathy with the administration, it's not the worst thing to just downgrade this thing and, and, and put it in the kind of see it in the dimensions which in, in, in which it properly belongs. There's a human catastrophe taking place not far from Israel in the province of Idlib. Let's worry more about that than whether Mahmoud Abbas is satisfied with this or that detail of uh, the Trump administration's uh, peace plan. Okay. So I think you're absolutely right. One of the things we've done is shrink this conflict to its proper size in the context of the rest of the Middle East. You refer to the Middle East a lot. What we're speaking about specifically now is the Israel-Palestinian issue. Does it relate to the region? Of course, we want the regional support. But it is one conflict of many. It is a, uh, a much smaller conflict. I don't want to diminish um, the Palestinians or the Israelis and certainly the terrorist acts that have murdered so many Israelis over the years and things like that. But it is not the most important thing in the region right now, uh, perhaps it was years ago, and we have to make sure people understand that. The other thing... So that, that means it's not the ultimate deal? I don't use that phrase. It, it is a deal that we would love to make for the benefit of Israelis, for the benefit of Palestinians, for the benefit of the region itself, but it is one thing that has to be fixed in a region. People used to always say, oh, this is the core conflict of the region. 
Maybe that was true decades ago. It is not the core conflict of the region. If we're lucky enough to solve it, you will still have the tragedy in Syria. You will still have Yemen. You will still have so many other things. And let's not forget the most important problem right now, which is Iran, which threatens everybody, Israelis, Saudi, UAE, and, of course, Palestinians. I mean, Palestinians are just as much in danger as Israel is when it comes to Iran. And America. And America. Um, the other thing that I would say, Brett, and um, perhaps mine is the most uh, frequent voice on it, although David is probably with me on this, but from the, from the president down, I don't think you've seen an administration that consistently <coughs> condemns just about every terrorist attack uh, I think our messaging on Gaza is not only worlds away from where other administrations were, but it's certainly worlds away from where the rest of the world is. You know, when there are attacks on Gaza, of course I feel terrible for the Palestinians that are dying there. Stop bringing your people to the fence. Stop throwing civilians towards the fence and make them, you know, put them in harm's way to, uh, to do that to Israel. What would any country do? What would any neighbor do if people are attacking you? So I think that uh, the rest of the world is upset with us for siding by Israel when it defends itself on the Gaza border. But I don't think anyone has been as vocal as this administration, all of us, uh, in terms of Israel's right to defend itself. Okay, so it, it, it sounds to me like you're actually in agreement on, on many things. Mm -hmm. I mean, Brett, one might even say that the reason the president didn't give a speech like that is in order not to magnify this as the be-all and end-all in the Middle East. He has certainly given speeches like that about Iran. That Iran is, is, is the great threat. And you, you both seem to agree that Iran is a greater threat than the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I know Israel certainly feels that way, and Prime Minister Netanyahu has been articulating that. Pr Prime Minister Netanyahu risked his relationship with President Obama to give a speech about Iran that the President didn't want to hear in 2015. Okay. Let's move on now to what... I just suggest one thing, because you mentioned the word speech. I guess, Brett, what would be interesting, and I haven't looked at this in, almost, in two years, the president did give what I thought then was an amazing speech in Riyadh when he went to visit Riyadh. It might be worth you and I looking at it again. Was that the speech? Because that's sort of the speech for the region, the battle between good and evil, that type of speech. But to do it now for this conflict until we're ready to launch. And when we're ready to launch, I think what you're saying makes absolute sense. I don't think it's the time to do it until then, but I think he might have given that speech in Riyadh in May of 17. Okay. Which was a strong condemnation of funding terrorism, et cetera. Okay, so let's... Uh, I praise that speech, by the way. Is that one of the columns people read? They all read your columns, Brett. We need a new okay. column like that. Okay. No, what happens is when I write columns that say something nice about the administration, only the left reads it. And when I write columns condemning the administration, only the right reads it. So, Well, at least in me, you have someone that reads both, okay? So let's move now to one of the things that Brett has been repeatedly referencing, a Palestinian state. Jason, I think one of the issues of unease... Uh, in people who follow in, in, in the pro-Israel camp and pro-Palestinian camp, people who follow this closely, is that we know nothing about this plan. And the plan has been talked about for at least two years, maybe longer, and we still know almost nothing about the plan. It has famously been remarked that this is the only thing the administration has not leaked. Um, and I really don't know how many people know, about the, know, know what the plan is. Is it 10? Is it, uh, I don't know, 20? Is it, it's a small number of people. That's what's, that's what's reported. But it, but it leads to all this confusion. Brett keeps on mentioning that he'd be opposed to a Palestinian state unless that Palestinian state is like Costa Rica. I think for the evangelical community, which formed the, the core political support of the president, even if it was like Costa Rica, they'd be opposed to a Palestinian state because their opposition is biblical as opposed to just security. Um, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, whose uh, photo sits behind us and was my uh, teacher and mentor, was opposed to any kind of territorial concessions and predicted with the Camp David Accords of 1978 and 79 that it would lead to increase in terrorism, delegitimization of Israel, and it would lead to an, an insatiable and unquenchable international desire for, for Israeli territory. And all three seem to, seem to happen. So you will reveal what you wish to reveal. You will not disclose what you don't want to disclose. But is Brett correct? Is there a Palestinian state? Because Brett keeps on bringing up a Palestinian state. Is there a Palestinian state in this, or is that just not even something that should be discussed? Because you seem to be really objecting to a plan based on some kind of Palestinian sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And I should also just mention, finally, if you don't mind, since you, uh, said, to, you said it earlier today, I saw it on the news, and now you mentioned it again, Jason, that this plan may be pushed off now to November 6th. 
because of the Israeli elections, which are September 17th, um, the, the, the president right now has 22, 25 Democratic opponents. He's in the fight of his life. And how much time is he going to have to give to this? And how many evangelical don uh, supporters can he really alienate? I saw a poll that said that the two biggest issues for evangelical uh, voters today is number one is uh, life and abortion. But a close second is Israel security, which is astonishing, and not giving back land, which for them is an absolute biblical mandate. So is there a Palestinian state? Do you want to mention anything about that? And how does the president navigate this on November 6th when we're going to be talking all 2020 all the time? Uh, on the evangelical note, I, I think that Israel has tremendous friends in the evangelical community. I mean, it's really amazing their support for the state of Israel. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I encourage you to get familiar with it. They're um, terrific when it comes to the state of Israel, its security, and other things as well. On the state, um, I'll tell you, people get upset on the left with us and others for not using the phrase two-state solution. We chose not to use it from early on because it means different things to different people. Uh, the word state means uh, something, as Brett described, is not the state that Saab Erekat would say it means, and it's not the state that evangelicals say it means. So we've completely stayed away from the labels. Uh, I'm not going to answer what is in the plan, but I will tell you that it only harms the prospects of peace for people to throw that label around. A lot of naive people think if you use the phrase and you sprinkle, sprinkle some fairy dust on this thing, something will go out of it, grow out of it that will be helpful. That's not the case. Uh, what we think we've created is something that protects Israel, allows Israel to continue to thrive, allows the Palestinians to create something that, could, that they could be proud of. One of the ironic things is that when the Palestinians in my office tell me after the meetings not to tweet it, I say to them, do you realize that what we're trying to create for you is something that you could leave my office and say, here's what I told Greenblatt. I said I was against this, but I said I love that. You can't do that right now. We're trying to help you do that. And they acknowledge that that's the unfortunate case in the lives uh, that they live right now. Uh, and it goes back to your other question about is it realistic that if we touch the Palestinian people and they uh, desire what we can give them or what we try to give them or what Israel might be willing to give them, will that work? And the answer is I don't know. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is this demilitarized state, one of the talking points. So it'll be a demilitarized state. That's only one issue of Israel's risk. Israel's risk today comes from terror tunnels, from rockets being fired at Israel. It's from bad actors within the territory like uh, Gaza, as Brett mentioned. So the fra even the phrase demilitarized state that is thrown around as if, oh, demilitarized state, Israel has no worries. Israel has a lot of worries, even with something that's labeled a demilitarized state. So the short answer to your question is what we think has been developed, uh, we hope is a realistic, implementable deal that both sides will have to compromise on, but may decide to embrace. We think it is probably um, the only deal that really works for both sides, but it is not going to hew to the talking points of the past. November 6th, that means the entire plan will be published. We'll know, okay. it, we'll know it in all its details. It'll right. be like the Mueller report that kind of just comes out. Ouch. <laughs> um, okay, bad comparison. I take that back. It'll be like, give me some. All right, you want.